Okay, good morning everybody. Congratulations to everybody who was able to attend an 8 a.m. session. So now it's 9.40, we are starting our next session. Welcome everybody. This conference fundamentally is about solutions. And so really the fundamental question for us is what should Australia and international aid policy do more or perhaps less of? No long blathering about this or that and what should happen in long theoretical academic pieces. Our brave presenters are here to share their ideas of what the aid community should do. Not in a 45 minute plenary, no, not in a 15 minute workshop session. All they need to demonstrate their brilliance is three minutes. <laughs> Count them, one, two, three, that's it. Welcome to the second annual three minute aid pitch. My name is Joel Negan, and I'll be your host for this morning. So each speaker gets three minutes, no more. There will be flashcards over here, and at three minutes they get the dreaded bell. And they will have to leave with boos and hisses. This is active participation, so you are asked to vote. So you will have been given one of these, which is your voting card with instructions. If anyone did not receive a voting card, please put up your hand and our kind assistants will distribute those. The instructions are up here. So on your smartphone. <laughs> Sorry, which one's right? That's right. Okay, ignore these, use that. <laughs> so please use the code here. Download it onto your smartphone, your computer, your app, your iPad, your tablet, your Samsung. Download the program and then please do not vote until all the speakers have spoken. Even if you are related to one of the speakers, please wait until all 10 have spoken. I know you're tempted to vote for your daughter or son or cousin, but please wait until they've all spoken. After each of our 10 brave speakers gives their three minute pitch, we will have time for some questions and comments during which you will be able to submit your vote and then we will click over to show results and you will be able to see who won the magical three map award. Uh, I'm just gonna provide names uh, of our speakers in order. Kate Sutton, David Hudson, Rosanna Duncan, Clara Henderson, Barry Reed, Joan Langmore, Emily Dwyer, Jonathan Prike, Clay O'Brien, Therese Faulkner. Please join me in uh, congratulating our brave um, speakers. They will come up in rapid fire. Now, cheering is encouraged. The occasional hear, hear is welcomed. So let's practice as a group. One, two, three. Hear, hear. Very good. Let's give them the encouragement that they need. So without further ado, may I invite and welcome Kate Sutton to the podium. Your time begins. Now. Excellent. Good morning. My name's Kate Sutton. I'm with Humanitarian Advisory Group. And my pitch is Aussie rules for humanitarians. It was suggested we should have a ball flying in at this point, but health and safety kind of ruled that out. <laughs> so in 1997, Adam Goods, this iconic footballer here in Australia, was playing for a small club in Victoria, the North Ballarat Rebels, where he was spotted by the Sydney Swans and he was recruited to play for the Australian Football League. Now, during this process, the Sydney Swans paid a fee to the North Ballarat Rebels, a compensation, if you will, a way of recognizing not only the contribution that that small club makes to building up the talent 
for footballing as a whole, but also for those individual players. Adam Goods went on to win two Brownlow medals. He was also Australian of the Year in 2014. The Australian Football League continues this practice of paying compensation to smaller clubs to recognize the value they bring to the system. So what does all this have to do with humanitarians? So last year, 2017, local and national organizations in Bangladesh prepared for the hundreds and thousands of refugees that were crossing the border into Bangladesh. The best and the brightest in those national and local organizations led on strategy, coordination, and implementation of the response. But over the course of weeks and months, those best and brightest got poached, recruited by international organizations in the UN. They left a decimated civil society. One national organization spoke of losing a really lucrative UN contract that they'd had for many years. Their lack of capacity was cited as the reason for that loss. The national director responded, well, it's very difficult when you've stolen over 10 of our senior staff in the last few months. So what can we learn from the AFL? Firstly, there is value in respecting and recognizing the role of smaller organizations within any given ecosystem. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> the other thing is there are models out there. Not only the Australian Football League, but also soccer clubs all around the world implement this practice of paying the smaller clubs when they recruit their members. So what am I proposing? Firstly, I am not proposing that staff should not be able to move. Of course they should. I am also not proposing that there is a simple solution or there is only one solution to the problem that I outline. What I am proposing is that when staff are recruited from a national organization into an national, international organization or the UN, there may be an opportunity to pay a compensation fee in order that we can better respect and recognize the role of those organizations. <laughs> Okay, next speaker is David Hudson, but before we start, I uh, wanted to ask to, to mention the Wi-Fi password, username Crawford, password Crawford School. So for any of the, those of you who need the Wi-Fi password. Um, next, David Hudson. Happy Valentine's, everybody. <laughs> um, so my pitch, for Australian aid and aid more generally, is that we change how we think, talk, and approach politics. And this has massive implications for uh, how we do aid uh, development uh, more generally. So yesterday, we launched, DLP launched uh, the 10-year synthesis of their work, of our work. It's written by four academics. Um, so hopefully, uh, I thought today, I'd give a slightly alternative take on the key messages in there that might be more interesting. <laughs> I'll let, you into a, I'll let you into a secret. I have a slight worry <laughs> that we might be thinking about politics in the wrong way. And, well, I think this applies to aid too. To be sure, donors and others have got much, much better about thinking about politics and taking it seriously, doing political economy analysis, etc. But it is very reductionist in it as a view of politics. It's very instrumental. And so... No matter how well-intentioned it is, I think there might be an alternative way to think about politics that allows us to approach this quite differently. What about ideas? What about debate, deliberation, contestation over what it means to have a good life and society's rules and our values, etc.? And this is a painting about Robert Owen's uh, Harmony, for example. But if this sounds a little fluffy for you, I look a bit idealistic talking about ideas all the time, <laughs> Not, not, not one of history's classic idealists, uh, I, would, I would argue. So, thinking about this then, if we want to take politics as the conflictual and productive <laughs> process of a society figuring out what it wants to do and how it wants to organize itself, what does this mean for aid? Well, let's imagine for a moment that it's 2015. 
and the, uh, the United States as a large, powerful country uh, who knows what's in uh, other countries' best interest, decides to do a political economy analysis of the Australian elite uh, as a way of trying to push through same-sex marriage uh, reform and legalization. So, this may, may well be successful. The political analysis might be well done. The, uh, the maneuvering and the lobbying might be well done, and the law gets passed. However, it's fragile. It's not legitimate. It hasn't been embedded within society's values and deliberated, et cetera. And so it's, it's, not, it's not sufficiently uh, part of, uh, of society's fabric uh, in the, the society that has brought in the reform. So what does this mean? Well, let's stop trying to short-circuit politics and treating it instrumental uh, in an instrumental way. That um, actually treating it much messier process a conflictual process is healthy and welcome, and that's what we should be doing. And so let's put politics at the heart of everything that we do in terms of uh, aid. Thank you. Wow, that's all I can say. How am I going to follow that? Do you have, so. do you have a PowerPoint? I've got one slide. One slide. There it is. This one? Yeah. Okay, and just a um, reminder, the voting code is 17512. Sorry, the code has changed from the card. Okay. <laughs> so it's not, not what's on the card, 17512, but we'll show it up again in a moment. Okay, over to Rosanna. Okay, thank you ever so much for inviting me here, everybody. So, I'm not here today to talk to you or to try and convert you around the reasons or why diversity and inclusion within the workforce, within the aid sector and development sector is important. I'm taking it as a given that you're all on that page. Judging by the um, amount of consideration we've given to gender equality over the last two days, I'm pretty sure we're all there and we're in the same spot. What I want to talk to you today about is how we change approaches to recruiting and attracting talent into the aid and development sector so we don't leave people behind. I believe currently, and it's, I think it's well accepted, that there are many approach, approaches that we currently use which actually leave a lot of people behind, including locally engaged staff, indigenous people, working class people, women, and lone parents. That list is not exhaustive, but that's just a few examples. So hold on to your seats, because what I'm going to suggest here might be a little bit radical for some of you. First of all, I suggest we scrap qualification requirements, unless there's a high level of technical ability needed. Why do we need a postgraduate or a degree? We should be looking at testing capability and also looking at testing potential, getting non-traditional people with non-traditional educational backgrounds. We should stop favoring elite schools and elite institutions. It just stops us getting high impact, high potential people, okay? We know, we also know that a lot of people in this list are not going to get those degrees necessarily because of inequalities, and then certainly not going to get into Ivy League or Red Brick Universities or the elite schools of Australia. I'm sorry. So, what we need to do is inclusive targeting marketing outreach. We also need to start thinking about training the people who are recruiting in the sector on unconscious bias and introducing blind recruitment methods so that we stop favoring people unnecessarily on these things. Stop the press. Type of experience. Okay. I've only got one minute left. Type of experience. So I see so many times in jobs for development and aid that people have to have experience of working overseas. Okay? I come from the inner city of Cardiff. Most of my peers, I'm from a place called Grangetown, most of my peers would not be able to afford to go and do a free voluntary placement or an internship. They would just think, wow, wow, how am I going to fundraise? Nobody I know has got any money. So... What we should be thinking about is what other kinds of experience can we consider to be transferable? If you're from a socially deprived or an economically deprived area and you're economically deprived yourself, you've got something to bring to the party and not just a Diet Coke. So years of experience, <laughs> we should scrap years of experience because years of experience tell us nothing. It's a lazy way to recruit. Who says that somebody's been doing 15, something for 15 years, they've been doing it well? No. So what we should be looking at is the competency that people have, not the length of experience and tying down pay. Paying conditions, I've got to move on, five seconds. Paying conditions. So we should make sure that we give entry-level people a salary that they can support themselves on, just not the, so they're the reserve of the rich. There we go. 
Thank you. Good morning, thanks for having me here, turning on health services remotely. This is a picture of India at night, 67% of the population live in rural settings. This is a picture of Papua New Guinea at night, 87% of the population live in rural and remote settings, and this perfectly demonstrates the lack of connectivity and access the rural and remote population has to electricity, roads, and health. Providing access to health in low-resource settings is hard to do. There are many obstacles to overcome, and this pitch articulates a sustainable solution based on knowing and upskilling remote healthcare workers. What can we do to make health accessible to the poor in rural settings? Well, first, what's missing? What are our constraints? In some cases, there's no transport at all. Or there's transport, but there's no petrol. And if this sounds minor, women can lose their lives in childbirth because there's no petrol. Health clinics remotely may operate with no electricity, generator broken, solar panels stolen. Yet women give birth at night, so a head torch can save a life. Healthcare workers cannot always access the drugs and vaccines that they need. Equipment can be broken and missing. And these are the realities of working on the remote front line of health. So, what can we do? What is there to work with in these remote settings with a large proportion of the population? What is there to work with? There's healthcare workers. Although they're a scarce resource, they are highly valued and a good investment. Healthcare workers in Papua New Guinea, like doctors and nurses in remote lo Australian locations, need, can and need to be multidisciplined and have a, a breadth of knowledge and skills. So this pitch here ties three components together to ensure healthcare workers feel supported and want to stay rural to do their jobs. Know them, train them, and support them. Know them. Uh, the rural and remote healthcare workers, what location do they work in? What training have they received? What competencies and skills do they have? What's missing? When was their last in-depth training session? What are the health issues that are presenting in their clinic? This knowledge informs us of the gaps across rural health areas on that front line. We can acquire this knowledge by building and managing a register of rural healthcare workers and map it against rural healthcare needs. Train them. Train rural healthcare workers in centres near to their home on in-depth topics that meet their needs, mindful of the realities of the healthcare system that they operate in, and thus fill knowledge gaps in both individual and health system-wide levels. <laughs> Back up that in-depth training with longer-term case-based on-the-job training in the familiarity of their own health clinic from a trusted and experienced healthcare professional using the equipment they have to hand and the medicines they have regular access to. Barry Reid. Good morning, colleagues. PNG has the world's highest rate of malignant mouth cancer. Mouth cancer comprises 25% of all cancers in PNG, compared to 2% in Australia. A disturbing trend is now becoming a disease of young people in PNG. Untreated, it quickly leads to death, with much pain, suffering, and facial deformity along the way. It's the number one cancer killer in males and the third highest killer amongst females. This is often because of delays in diagnosis leading to delays in treatment. Sadly, early diagnosis is very uncommon and delayed detection is the norm. Because of this, patient long-term survival rates can be as low as 20%. If these delays can be reduced, it means the growth may be removed while still small and the long-term survival rate could increase to 80%. Four types of delays result in late diagnosis and treatment. First is the delay in the patient seeking care due to the lack of knowledge of mouth cancer symptoms. 
the second eye is from the health worker not recognising early signs of mouth cancer, thus, thus delaying their diagnosis of cancer. The third eye is the time it takes to arrange a biopsy so treatment can start. Together, these delays can average six to eight months. The final delay is in getting treatment. For one patient with large cancer, an operation can take all day, so waiting lists can be long. In contrast, while being diagnosed early, while the cancers are small, operations are shorter, meaning up to five times as many operations in a single day. This enhances well the impact of our health aid spending. The spending for my three pictures is tiny compared to two predictions last year that mouth cancer cases will double in 12 years and treatment could consume most of the health budget within a few years. My first pitch is for aid to increase early diagnosis by education of health workers and the public about the signs of early mouth cancer and to seek help early. Health workers should routinely, routinely examine the mouth as many people first come to seek advice from dental workers, community health workers or doctors. All three groups need to be upskilled in detecting early cancers quickly. They then need to swiftly refer on to a surgeon or dentist able to do a biopsy. To further reduce delays, my second pitch is that more dentists need upskilling in biopsy techniques. I started training dental undergraduates for both in 2017 as a self-funded volunteer. My third pitch is to reduce the three most important causes of mouth cancer and PNG, betel nut chewing, tobacco use and heavy alcohol consumption. 50 to 80% of people smoke tobacco. Once reserved for sacred events, up to 80% now chew betel nut, including pregnant women. A mounting tragedy is now common for children as young as eight years to chew betel nut. A local surgeon said these children would be likely to get cancer before the age of 30. There needs to be permanent public campaigns for prevention to warn about these causes of cancer, together with national educational Facebook sites. At schools are permanent... <laughs> Thank you. John Langmore is next. Do you have a slide? <coughs> no? Okay. which attract international intervention, is now 10 times higher than it was in the 1940s. Conflict is the principal impediment to development in many countries. Slaughter of civilians and soldiers, destruction of housing and infrastructure, destroy economic security and opportunity. Every conflict requires different strategies, inclusive negotiation, empathetic mediation, tough bargaining, can sometimes narrow differences and resolve conflicts. In the past, Australians played a significant role in achieving compromises in Cambodia and Bougainville, which led to ending civil wars. Rapid expansion of conflict prevention on action through the UN, governments and NGOs is now essential. Yet massive Australian government cuts to aid have savaged the UN and starved diplomacy. The project which I lead at the University of Melbourne proposed to DFAT a survey of diplomats, soldiers, police and others <coughs> to identify ways of strengthening <coughs> conflict prevention. DFAT allocated 100,000 to the project and the University of Melbourne also put in 100,000. We applied to the ARC for a linkage grant for the rest of the funds. The assessors said we were a dream team and the project was clearly needed. The ARC announced that it wouldn't fund it <laughs> last week. <laughs> they gave no reason for their capricious decision. <laughs> the week before, the Turnbull government announced that it is allocating $3.8 billion to subsidise Australian companies exporting weapons. The Cavalier waste will exacerbate conflict, multiply destruction and undermine security wherever the weapons are sold. They couldn't give us 400,000, they can put 3.8 
billion into subsidising weapons manufacturers. Australian public priorities must be transformed. We can all allocate, uh, advocate increased support for conflict prevention and we can vote for it at the next election. <laughs> coming up, so do get ready. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, indeed, um, which is a great day to be talking about sex, but it's also the first day of Lent, where for some Christians a period <laughs> that they don't have sex. Yesterday, Hindus celebrated Shiva, a sex and gender bending deity, and on Friday, Sydney's Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras kicks off, which all goes to show the significance and diversity of sexuality. But it's a conversation, friends, that development practitioners are often not part of. But other people are talking about sex, they're singing about sex, they're singing about sex so much that academics make charts about all the different <laughs> kinds of sex <laughs> in country pop and R&B songs. And in fact, songs in the top 10 have more sexual references than songs that don't. In fact, 92% of the top 10 songs have at least one reference to sex, <laughs> more so than abstracts at the Australasian Aid Conference. <laughs> When we do talk about sex, we often talk about sex in the negative. We talk about sex and disease, and we talk about sex and violence, and those can be important things to talk about. But people, we are strength-based, and so we should be talking about <laughs> the joys, the pleasures, the connections, all the good things that are about sex, because sex is a development issue. Sexuality matters to people, and not just in Western pop songs. Cornwall and Jolly note that uh, the case of a Tanzanian woman whose husband, about to take a second wife, complained that she would be deprived of pressure, pleasure. We sometimes think that tradition, that culture, that custom are anti-sex, when in fact from Africa to parts of South Asia and beyond, there are deep sex positive cultural resources to draw upon. Sex is also a, more than a health issue. It's a political, social and economic issue. And discrimination based upon sexuality can lock people into poverty. And because development affects sexuality, our funding and restrictions around our programs mean that we effectively regulate aspects of sexuality, and so we should talk about it. But how do we talk about sex? Maybe before we talk about sex, we need to talk about how we talk about sex, because <laughs> while some people are happy to talk about sex, other people and organisations don't really want to talk about sex, and because it needs to be a conversation which is inclusive of cultures and faiths, and that can survive disagreements between us. Doesn't that sound like a great topic for hashtag Australasian Aid Conference 2019? <laughs> let's talk about no, sex me now. To the people at home or in the crowd, it keeps coming up anyhow. Don't be coy, avoid, or make void the topic, because that ain't going to stop it. Oh. Let's tell it like it is and how it could be, how it was, and of course, how it should no, come on, spin. Let's talk about sex, baby. Prank, unfortunately. No. I'm gonna bring you guys all crashing back down there. <laughs> um, I really wanted to start with a joke, but um, you know, the state of the Australian aid program is no laughing matter. <laughs> you all know the story: 30% cut to the aid program, uh, the hostile takeover of aid into DFAT, the attrition of staff. Um, every poll I've seen shows that there's tenuous public support for aid. We, can't, we like it, but we don't really think much about it. We think we give too much, but we don't actually know how much we give. Um, and no one outside of this room actually votes on it. <laughs> there isn't even tenuous support for the aid program in our foreign policy community. The aid program makes up two-thirds of DFAT's operating budget, but is still seen as an inconvenience, inconvenience that needs to be managed rather than an effective foreign policy tool. To illustrate this, just look at the Australian uh, foreign policy white paper. The aid program got as much mention in that as Antarctica, an uninhabited <laughs> continent. 
This all starts at the political level, where we've completely lost bipartisan support for the aid program. Research presented yesterday by Ben Day and Joe Spratt just shows just how important a political constituency is for the aid program. Uh, whatever aid advocacy we have engaged in to date has clearly failed. So what do we do differently? We have relied for far too long on amateur and disparate aid advocacy efforts that focus too much on the public and not enough on the political elite. Oak Tree, the churches, an unwieldy NGO community with conflicting priorities, the Campaign for Australian Aid. It's time to professionalise aid advocacy. What we need is an aid lobbyist. A group that knows where power lies in Parliament, how to get to it, and how to tailor a personal narrative on why the aid program is important with every MP and every power broker that they meet. Amen. What we... <laughs> Let's hire the, the team the Minerals Council use. They know how to get stuff done. <laughs> This, this sort of lobbying would, co would comp be complemented well by enhancing the work that the Gates Foundation is currently funding through Save the Children on Parliamentary Study Tours, where we take the MPs to actually see what Australian aid is doing on the ground. Uh, and, you know, the question I'm sure you're all asking is, well, that sounds great, Jonathan, but how do we pay for it? Well, we all want to see an aid program that, can, that is about 0.5% of Australia's national income, right? right? Let's all start putting our money where our mouths are. Uh, if the private sector, universities and NGOs took 0.5% of the income they earned from implementing the aid program in 2015, we'd have $9 million. That's a damn good start. <laughs> the, the private sector could take the lead here. In the year the cuts fi uh, fully hit, your funding increased 13%. <laughs> you now implement just under a quarter of the Australian aid program and you make a profit. There's also only nine of you managing the lion's share of that many of which have recently been bought out by global companies who I'm pretty sure have a good handle on how lobbying works. <laughs> it's time to step up. I can already hear all the sector grumbling. I get it. You're all hard done by uh, and resources are stretched thin. You're doing the best you can and you just can't afford it. But ask yourself this. Can the aid program afford to have no investment in advocating for its future? Recent history says no. So if you had no idea what 3MAP stands for, then IB for ID was probably way beyond you. <laughs> what I'm proposing though is that Australia sets up a sovereign development finance institution, or a DFI, in order to engage in the growing, the growing market for impact and or social investing that is revolutionising overseas aid. A DFI can uh, make loans, take equity and provide guarantees to support private and investments promoting development. But why, I hear you say, allow evil bankers into aid? <laughs> well, the foxes are in the hen house already, I'm afraid, and I am one of them. I mean, I got out of investment banking 16 years ago to go into microfinance, and even back then, it had proven itself as the first successful case of what is now known as impact investing. And here are some of the very impressive uh, financial and impact returns from an early example where money was put into a Mexican microfinance institution. So there are at least four reasons why I think establishing an Australian DFI is timely. First, as we've all heard, Australia's aid budget is smaller than it was and even less than once forecast. So it is important to do things more efficiently and effectively. The UK's DFI, CFC, has achieved a 7% annual return whilst building its capital base, catalyzing other investors into its projects and creating economic growth. Using impact investment will also be consistent with the one page mention in the foreign policy white paper that said that Australian aid program should deliver results and value for money. Second, donors are putting less money into aid and grants anyway, and more into impact investments. And now in areas like FinTech, renewable energy, infrastructure, healthcare and education. It is estimated that the impact investment market will be four times global ODA in less than five years. Thirdly, most OECD countries, including Canada, the US and those shown, already have a, a DFI. And this, uh, but as Bob McMullen has mentioned, um, their focus is not in the Indo-Pacific region. They're working in other parts of the world. 
Finally, an Australian DFI could provide a permanent institution in which to build expertise in the area of private sector development and foreign aid generally. And its name does not have to begin with Oz. <laughs> DFAT is already allocating the aid budget into projects such as the Emerging Markets Impact Investment Fund. However, this is being done through grants only. But that's a bit like paying someone else to learn how to drive your new car. A DFI would place Australia behind the wheel at the forefront of this new form of development assistance. Moreover, it would allow Australia to transition its aid program away from grants only to instruments such as debt, equity and guarantees already part of other countries' ODA. Last but not least. Okay, good morning. The winning idea of last year's three minute aid pitch was we need to communicate aid better. Thanks, Ashley. Better rich. Um, <laughs> I've taken this idea and developed three simple aid <laughs> messages that we aid enthusiasts in government, NGO, academia, and the private sector can use when we engage with the non-aid enthusiasts. We know that aid and development assistance is complex. There are a multitude of issues and strands that can be bewildering for those of us working in this sector, let alone those who don't. Speaking the jargon of aid and development can be just like putting up a brick wall. The purpose of the aid program is pretty good and we all get it, but do Shazza and Dazza from SBS's <laughs> Logie Award winning show, Howzos, do they get it? Let's try these simple messages. Message number one, overseas aid comprises less than 1% of Australian government spending. We talk about the UN target of 0.7% of GNI to be spent on ODA. The Australian public thinks the government spends more on aid than it actually does, even though only 22 cents in every $100 of GNI is spent on aid and development. It's confusing for Shazza and Dazza, which is why statements made by Pauline Hanson and also by Jackie Lambie about how cutting foreign aid will help Australian pensioners, these messages resonate with the Australian public. And when you don't understand aid, Cutting it seems like a very good idea. So let's make it simpler to understand. For a start, let's stop comparing government spending apples with the ODA GNI oranges. There is a $464 billion aid spending pie. Ooh, sorry. There it is, there's the spending pie. So if that pie was $100, then the government is spending $58 on health, welfare and education, and it's spending just 84 cents on aid. So I'm not sure that um, halving that 84 cents, an extra 42 cents will make a huge difference to the pensioners. Right, message number two. Aid is not cash, it's doing useful stuff with Australian expertise. So we're not handing over cash to corrupt regimes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're training midwives, we're getting kids into school, we're teaching adults, we're improving health services, we're building roads, and we're helping farmers. So message number three, aid helps people overseas and it helps Australians too. The purpose of the aid program can be roughly translated into, we do good things for poor people overseas, helps them, helps us too. So good things for them include better health, education, access to services, reduced poverty, opportunities for jobs and a happier life. Good things for us include jobs and trade and reduced security threats and people thinking Australia's cool. So there's the three. Okay, thank you very much to our wonderful and brave presenters. They did fantastically well. Thank you very much to all of them. So voting is now open, so please take a second and start registering your votes. We do have, sorry, the code is 17512. Okay, voting is now open. 
We do have a little bit of time for uh, comments or questions from the audience while people figure out their technology. Um, we do have some microphones up here. Are there any comments or reflections or questions from members of the audience to any of the specific speakers or in general? Have any questions or comments? We have one in front here. <clears throat> okay, we have a question, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Um, to the speaker who gave that brilliant talk on qu qualifications not being necessary, elite education, context networks, do you feel all, at all guilty for calling for every single person in this room to be out of a job? <laughs> Listen, it's not getting people out of a job, it's thinking that if we're going to uh, continue as a, an industry, then we need people coming in. And we need to have diversity of thought to maximise the outputs that we have for the people that we work with in communities across the world. We need to harness the potential of having a diverse workforce. And that's just not the way people look, it's also di this diversity of thought. Okay, so it's, that's what it's about. Additional questions or comments? I had one regarding um, talking about sex. What, what would that mean for our aid program? I, if we agree that we should talk about it, what would that actually mean for um, how we did things differently? I think one place to start would be to listen to a lot of other people in, in, our, in our countries and where we're doing our programs and, and, he, and hearing them. Um, so, for example, in, in Indonesia at the moment, we know that there's, there's, a, there's a challenge with, the, say, the, the criminal code coming in. And that has a potential to, to criminalise um, a lot of, all, all sex outside of marriage, which would you know, challenge a lot, of, a lot of women, but also challenge a lot of sexual and sexual gender minorities. Um, and there is there's activism and there are, there are projects in, in a country like, like in Indonesia which work around the, the, mar the margins of that. And I think we would really need to think about talking about those activists, talking about talking to local organisations and, and building that sort of deep contextual picture that we've been hearing about in the, in the, in the conference to think about, well, how, how, how is it best for, for our, for our programmes to think about sex? We can also think about all kinds of assumptions about sex that are built into our programmes because there are heteronormative and cisnormative and binary assumptions. We, we assume that everyone's heterosexual. We assume that, that every, everyone is cisgendered, that you have the same gender that you were assigned at birth. We assume we often make no allowance for intersex people that, that blow some of the boundaries up. So I think there's all kinds of ways that it would influence our programming from challenging some of our core assumptions to working in solidarity with, with people that are trying to, you know, enjoy, enjoy good life and get themselves out of poverty. Yay! <laughs> Questions or comments? I just wanted to ask the person who presented the three aid ideas if they could just give them again because they flash past so fast. <laughs> Sorry, they flashed by far. So, yeah. So, the first one is um, it is less than 1% of Australian government spending. I think that resonates more with people than um, the percentage of GNI. The aid is not cash, um, but it's doing useful stuff. And the third one about helping people overseas is predominant, but it also helps us as well. Okay, are people still <coughs> finishing their voting? Uh, just a quick question, how many people in the room receive money from the aid program in some capacity? And how many of you would be willing to provide 0.5% of the money that you receive to, <laughs> to the sector? <laughs> yeah, it's not bad, it's a start. That's a few bucks there. Other questions or comments? Okay, is anyone um, still not voted? Last chance or forever hold your peace? So 
Shall we see the results? I hope this works. Fingers crossed, everybody. Hey. Rosanna, congratulations. She told me before she started that she was very nervous. She didn't want to hold the microphone because she thought she would shake too much. So I think I've done very well. So congratulations, Rosanna. Congratulations to everybody. That was a wonderful. I think it went well, you can admit. Great. Thank you very much, everybody, for your participation and your contribution. Congratulations, Rosanna, and to all the speakers. Uh, we have morning tea now, and the next session starts at... No, at 11. <laughs>